Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, firefighters stop a garage fire from spreading to a house. A life scout adds a garden area to Daniel Axford and OMS custodian honored as a support person of the year. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Oxford firefighters prevented a garage fire from spreading to a house after the homeowner discovered smoke and flames inside their two-car garage. Oxford Fire Chief Pete Schultz said heavy smoke was pouring from the structure when the fire crew arrived. The cause of the fire remains undetermined and the incident remains under investigation. The Oxford Village Council voted 3-2 to two to temporarily remove barriers that divide Dayton Street from Waterstone Subdivision. Fire Chief Pete Schultz requested the change for a second time. The purpose, this time, is to provide firefighters quick response times to the northern and western parts of the township during the M24 construction project in 2020. Several years ago, the chief made the same request but was turned down by council after several Dayton Street residents stated the change would potentially increase the traffic volume in their neighborhood. This time, the chief promised to close that access after the M24 construction is complete. Voting in favor of creating the access points were point were council members Allison Kemp, Dave Bailey, and Kate Logan. Voting against the motion were Village President Joe Frost and Councilwoman Maureen Helmuth. How, the enforce, how they will enforce that change will be addressed at the council's next meeting on Tuesday, May 28th at 6.30 p.m. And over 100 people participated in the first ever Oxford Middle School color run. Runners doused themselves with packets of peacock powder and colored cornstarch. They then began doing laps around the school grounds. Along the course, they were repeatedly pelted with more colored powder until they looked like uh, rainbows with legs. Mm -hmm. Cassie McNeil, the seventh grader uh, or seventh grade geography teacher who organized the color run said the event netted approximately $1,300. The money will be used to help teachers purchase supplies needed to help students enhance their classrooms or conduct lessons. A former Daniel Axford Elementary student returned to his school to create a quiet outdoor space where students can read, learn, and develop an appreciation for the outdoors. In pursuit of his Eagle Scout badge, DJ Moore oversaw the installation of five planter boxes on the school's west side. A bench made of nearly 2,500 recycled milk jug jugs will soon be added to the area to provide seating. Moore is a member of the Boy Scout Troop 366. Congratulations, kiddo. Oxford Village Police say distracted driving was the cause of a May 15th accident that left a vehicle resting on its roof in the middle of the road. According to the police report, a 42-year-old Oxford woman was heading west uh, in her 2019 Ford EcoSport when she reached for her cell phone and struck a 2018 Ford EcoSport parked on the road's shoulder. Fortunately, the woman suffered only minor injuries, but she was ticketed by officers for careless driving. An upended tractor trailer laying across the northbound lanes of M24 caused traffic delays for several hours this week. Oakland County Sheriff said the tractor trailer swerved to miss a woman in a small Ford vehicle who pulled out in front of it. The truck driver was unable to miss the car and ended up flipping upon impact. Neither the Ford driver or her passenger were injured. The truck driver was transported to the hospital with minor injuries. The American Legion Post 108 is celebrating its 100th anniversary, so members of the East Drainer Road Oxford American Legion are inviting veterans and their families to the Post at noon on Sunday, June 9th, 
to enjoy a free meal and learn more about the organization. Post Commander Dave Perry said Post 108 is using its 100th anniversary as an opportunity to recruit new members. Perry believes the American Legion is the perfect organization for veterans who want to be active in their community. Kristen Squires is the first shift lead custodian at Oxford Middle School. Her contributions have not gone unnoticed as she has won the 2019 Support Person of the Year Award for the Northeast Quadrant of Oakland County. That's something else. Squires has been working at OMS for nine years. She's well respected, valued, and relied upon by staff and students alike. Principal Beasley says Squires does whatever it takes to help us be successful in a, and is considered the school's go-to person. Congratulations. Wearing their caps and gowns, a portion of the Oxford's graduating class gathered in the High School Performing Arts Center Sunday evening to express their faith before receiving their diplomas. Surrounded by family members and friends, the graduates participated in the 2019 baccalaureate service organized by members of both Oakland, or I'm sorry, Oakwood Community Church and St. Joseph Catholic Church. Oxford High School senior Josh Shainer has been recognized for his talents. The Michigan Industrial and Technology Competition at Oakland Community College in Auburn Hills campus is where he was recognized. Shainer placed second in the steering and suspension category and third in brakes. There were a total of eight categories that tested students' knowledge and skills. Shainer still has one year to go in the Oxford uh, the five-year Oxford School Early College program. He attends Macomb Community College as part of that program. I'll be darned. <laughs> Isn't that something? You can go to high school, you can attend college classes, he's in a five-year program, and winning awards besides. I'm telling you, Oxford's doing great with their students. Yes, they are. They're doing very well. I'm, and I'm uh, Speaking of people that do things very well, I'd like to uh, mention a few names. Uh, Tim oh, yeah. Bates from mm -hmm. uh, Spectrum, uh, yeah. in recognition of the hard work that he put into uh, doing the design engineering you know, for the station for fiber optics. For, for us moving in here, moving everything in. had to be reconstructed and yes. reconfigured. And, and I'll tell you yeah, how dedicated this guy is and what a good worker he is for Spectrum and a good um, image for them. Uh, his wife was in the hospital under right. major surgery uh -huh. and he was working from the hospital via telephone Talk, and coordinating everything. Yeah. And wow. uh, great job. We did yeah. get it in. Uh, we had some issues before that. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim jumped in, did the engineering portion and the layout yeah, and uh, organized the people to do the job. Yeah. Next person I want to talk mm -hmm. about is Nate. Nate, he's yeah. a good guy. Uh, Nate Coat, and he is uh, with Spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. And he does uh, all the telephone cable. Uh, coordination. He has a team of about 10 or 12 people that work for him there. Yeah. And when we ran into issues, uh, the, he coordinated uh, those issues with uh, Tim Bates. They got it to run smooth. Uh, everything here is running up and you know, according to par. Yep. AT&T is another one. And uh, AT&T, uh, uh, Alicia Marshall pitched in, provided uh, IP addresses and everything required yeah, to get... Yeah, that took a while. It that did. took us a while. Now we finally have two lines. People yes. were having a hard time um, contacting us because we only had one line. So Absolutely. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> well, the other thing is uh, Curtis Tolkien. Uh, Curtis. And he's what I yeah. call my shadow. Yeah. He's yeah. the IT Bless guy along heart. with me. And he's uh, he yeah. actually is a subcontract to, through Calvary uh, Computing, which right. is his firm. Mm -hmm. He does major, large... Uh, projects throughout the yes, nation, he does. and mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Davisburg, Michigan. Yeah, without him, we wouldn't have Ethernet cables. We wouldn't have oh, all gosh. the IP addresses yeah. for all the uh, um, equipment, the edit yeah. equipment that we mm -hmm. have, and they're moldable. And mm -hmm. of course, new servers too, and everything mm -hmm. had to be set up in terms of IP addresses. Yeah, and, and so he forth. he was doing that while his wife was having a baby. So yes. we had some pretty um, dedicated people getting yeah. us up and running and helping you get it, getting yeah. us up and running. And and definitely pat yourself on the back for that too. Well, I don't want to do that because these people are in the background they work really hard and they coordinated things. Well, everybody did. And yeah. There were some issues where we we didn't make uh, couldn't make contacts in order to get yeah. things coordinated. Mm -hmm. Tim 
jumped in there and did a fantastic it's, job as yeah, the others did too. And I want I can only say thank you, thank you, thank you yeah, to all these people. Yeah, right. So we're on the air because of all those people. It was no easy task getting us moved. And speaking of that, we ha are having an open house on um, May, excuse me, June 5th at 4 o'clock until mm -hmm. 5, 530 ish. We are at 2975 Seymour Lake Road. We're attached to the um, Parks and Recs building mm -hmm. at Seymour Lake Park. Come and see our new studio. It's so pretty in here. Hey, and I, we'll probably have snacks or two. Connie mm -hmm. has volunteered to make some little goodies. Should so. be fun. Yeah. I, I have to apologize from standpoint that when I did the prompter, I gave you the wrong dates. No, and that's she right. recovered very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're already past May 5th, but, oh, no problem. And that's what happens here um, at the studio, and we pick up and carry on from there. And that's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories or others, you can pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper, or better yet, you can watch us on our website at occtv.org, on YouTube, and of course our regular cable channel Spectrum, Channel 191, and AT&T Channel 99. Coming up soon, OCTV's very own Cody Wright with School Sports and Schooling, I'm sorry, School News with Alexis Ware. Don't want to miss that. I know. And you won't want to miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles, and thanks for watching us for News This Week, where we bring your news closer to home. I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, most suns-like stars rotate relatively quickly in their history, spinning once every few days before slowing down as they age. But sodium and potassium on the moon show that our sun had a lazy start, which may explain why we are here today. The moon has surprisingly fewer volatile elements and components, most that turn into gas and blow away relatively easily than Earth. Pravil Saxena at NASA's Goddard Space uh, Flight Center in Maryland and his colleagues investigated whether solar activity in the first billion years or so after the moon formed could explain the discrepancy. Saxena and his team used data from the Kepler Space Telescope and on other uh, sun-like stars to build three models of the young Earth and the moon, each with the sun rotating at different rates. The faster the young sun rotated, the more often it would have experienced flares and coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, blasting huge plumes of plasma into space and battering the inner solar system. They found that for fast and even medium rotating models, there were too many CMEs. Even if the sun rotated just about once every week, there would be tens of CMEs a day, enough to erode away all the moon's potassium and much of its sodium, volatile elements that we know still exist there today. They found that if the sun was a slow rotator turning just once every eight to 10 days, Earth and the moon would experience just about one powerful CME every few days. It was still relatively chaotic in that first 500 million to a billion years, says Saxena. It's like deciding between going to either a heavy metal concert or a hard rock concert. It's different, but still loud. That would have left enough sodium and potassium on the moon to match observations. In modern times, the sun turns only once every 27 or so days, which is good for us because a faster rotation and more CMEs would be incredibly bad for both volatiles like water and the living organisms that need them. The fact that the sun seems to have started slow, allowing Earth to hold on to its volatiles could help explain why life arose here in the first place, Saxena says. In our next story, there's a new way to weigh. For over a century, the kilogram was defined by a metal cylinder in a French vault. Now, the key unit of mass is defined using the Planck constant, a fundamental figure in physics. The Planck constant relates to a photon's energy, its photon's energy to its frequency. This incredibly small number has to be measured by a very sensitive Kibble balance that uses a powerful magnetic field to do its work. Researchers will now be able to weigh things accurately without flying to France to compare them with the cylinder known as Le Grand K or the International Prototype Kilogram. If it lost mass, perhaps by being scratched or gained through, say, fingerprints, say, the definition of the kilogram would alter. By comparing the Lagrange K with other copies that are distributed globally, it was clear that despite efforts to protect the precious cylinders, their mass did change. At last, the kilogram will join science's other units to become universal and unchanging. 
In our last story, here comes a glue that can mend a broken heart. A new material can repair cuts in pig's hearts without using any stitches, and it can be absorbed by the body over time. Hang Wei Uyang at the Zhejiang University in China and his colleagues use polymers and water to create a glue that mimics the composition and viscous gel of proteins that help with wound repair in animals. Once activated by UV light, the glue reacts with proteins in biological tissues to form tight chemical bonds sticking to tissue surface tightly and sealing the wound. The team tested the technique in four pigs. They punctured a hole in the left ventricle of each heart using a needle. Then the glue was applied to the wounds followed by a dose of UV light. In less than 30 seconds, the bleeding stopped. After two weeks, the team dissected the pigs and found no leaks between the gel and their heart tissue and very little inflammation at the wounds, says Wu Yang. No current existing clinical products can stop operative heart bleeding so quick and efficiently, says Wu Yang. The bonds are strong enough to withstand blood pressure twice the normal uh, blood levels, meaning it won't burst when the heart contracts and pumps out blood. To test the gel's biodegradability, the team injected the gel into rats underneath their skin. Only about 20% of the glue remained after eight weeks and no adverse reaction was observed. Good thing. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of School News. This past week, Lakeville Elementary had their incoming kindergartners event. OHS had senior academic awards. There were grad rehearsals as well as Oxford High School's graduation at DTE. Oxford Early College had a capstone night, and there were two exhibitions for the elementary schools. So stay tuned for coverage of these events and more on the Schooling Around segment Monday through Friday at 10 and 2. Moving into school news for this week, Monday, May 27th, the entire district is closed in observance of Memorial Day. Tuesday, May 28th, Clear Lake and Lakeville fifth graders have a middle school visit. Wednesday, May 29th, OES and Leonard have their own middle school visit. That day, the 6th graders are also holding their awards that night from 6.30 until 7.30 in the OMS Fieldhouse. And Oxford Virtual Academy is holding their graduation from 7 to 8 in the Performing Arts Center as well. Thursday, Oxford Elementary School's 5th graders have their exhibition from 6 to 8. Leonard has a field day for the students and Bridges has their graduation from 7 until 8.30 in the Performing Arts Center at OHS. Friday is the 8th graders end of the year field trip at Cedar Point. Leonard is hosting a Donuts with Dads event from 8 to 9. Oxford Elementary School has a Student of the Month breakfast starting at 8. And they're also doing a field day the same day at 1 until 3.30. A lot in store coming up for this upcoming week, so be stay tuned. In board news, if you missed the last Board of Education meeting on Tuesday, May 14th, you may have also missed the opportunity to see some of the Oxford's top seniors enrolled in the International Baccalaureate Program. So here are a few of those seniors. Take a look. We invited in, uh, 11 of our 16 seniors. Our students walking up right now are in our diploma program, our International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. I'll let them line up here. That's, a, that's one minute per person. I think I've been allotted. Uh, I'll, I'll be really brief because there's a lot to say about this group of students. So right now we're in the middle of testing. So if they look a little tired, uh, our students are taking between 12 and, and 14 uh, different tests right now within a, a two and a half, three week window that includes a DP test and some AP tests that they're choosing to take on top of our DP courses. And so these students, the best way to describe them are, are very hardworking, independent learners that kind of uh, creatively drive their own growth while they're here at the high school, not just in the content areas, but in their own self-growth. Um, and these students are ve very well-rounded and balanced. I think later on today, Mr. Weaver is going to present a little bit of the district's uh, profile of a graduate, uh, what we aim for our students to be when they leave here, when they walk across the stage as graduates. And these students right here are really the, the benchmark uh, of what we're aiming for when we create a profile and not sort of a graduate. Very well balanced, very well rounded. That was footage from the last Board of Ed meeting where high school principal Mr. Stephen Wolf recognized 11 students who are excellent examples of a star student. To see the full video, visit our Facebook at Oxford Community Television or our YouTube at Oxford Community Television. Remember that if you would like to be in attendance at one of these events, the entire community is welcome to come out. They are housed at a different location every meeting, so be sure to check in for the right location. 
The meetings also always discuss policy, educational goals and concerns, curriculum changes, and annual budget maintenance. Community members do have a selected time to address the board with their comments set aside on the agenda available every meeting. The next Board of Ed meeting was, will be held next week, Tuesday, May 28th at Oxford Elementary School. All meetings start at 6.30. Before we go, if you attended prom or graduation this year and would like an opportunity to be featured on School News and Schooling Around, submit your prom pictures and grad pictures to manager at OCCTV.org or on Facebook at Oxford Community Television for a chance to appear on the next few episodes of School News. Parents, grandparents, teachers, and students can all submit pictures with a name, a short description of the student, their college they're attending next year, high school memories, or whoever they would like to thank. We're making this all about the seniors, so congratulations again, alumni. And that about wraps up school news for this week, but don't go anywhere yet. Next up is Cody Wright with School Sports. What's happening, Wildcat fans? Cody Wright back here once again for this week's sports report. Uh, we're just about done with our high school spring sports schedule. Just a few more weeks and we will be slowly transitioning into our summer sports. Uh, anyhow, let's take a look at what happened this last week. Uh, first off, the JV and freshman baseball teams were very busy. On the 18th, JV taking on Livonia Churchill in a doubleheader here at home, uh, taking both wins, sweeping the day 5-4 and 11-4. Uh, on the 20th, the freshman club then took on Clarkston, also here at home, uh, in a doubleheader once again, and they split the day, Clarkston grabbing a win 5-1, to one, uh, the Wildcats breaking it even 9-6. to six. And then on the 21st, the JV team went on the road to take on Utica, and once again, a doubleheader, and they brought out the brooms for that one as well, taking the sweep uh, with wins 3-2 to two and 4-3. to three. Uh, on the other hand, the girls softball team struggled this last week. Uh, the varsity club had a doubleheader on the road taking on Wald Lake Northern, uh, falling in both games 12 to 6 and 12 to 1. Uh, baseball and softball are two sports that are still alive uh, with their season. However, there isn't much time left. So if you haven't made it out to the ballpark this year, now's the time to do it. Uh, as for the season's ending, we'll start with one of our favorite this year, the boys lacrosse team. Uh, they had a phenomenal season this year. Head coach Sean Regan's first season is in the books, and we are excited for the next year. Uh, the boys fell in game one of districts on the road, taking on tough competitors of Waterford Mott. The final score was 8-5. Uh, these guys dominated most of the season, and the tough part about playoff sports is how quickly it can all end. Anyhow, we want to thank all the players, coaches, and of course the parents uh, for such a great season. We look forward to the next one. Uh, also, the girls lacrosse season ended as well on Wednesday at Heartland, falling hard to a final score of 16-4. to Heartland was a good team, and that's all we can say about that. Either way, the season for the girls was a blast as well. And last but certainly not least, the girls soccer team ended their season Wednesday as well, taking on Eisenhower here at home in game one. Uh, this one really stings because, because it was very close. The final score was three to two. Uh, playoffs can be unpredictable, and most of these games are often uh, decided on the drop of a dime. Plays made successfully by a matter of inches. And when it comes down to it, the whole season can end just like that. Uh, it's what makes sports exciting, so we have nothing to complain about. It was a fun year. Uh, the girls ended with an overall record of 9, 3, and 5. Uh, sisters Mac uh, Mackie and Lauren Metner uh, getting the two last goals for the Wildcats on the year. Uh, anyhow, the sports report is bittersweet, saying goodbye to some great seasons as well as some great senior athletes. However, we are looking forward to our summer sports coming up. Uh, this summer, the Tough Mudders is coming back to town as well as the Midwest Lax Bash, the big lacrosse tournament hosted here at Seymour Lake Park. Uh, we also have rec softball with boys and girls from many different age groups. And you can't forget my, very, uh, my favorite senior softball, which all lies just around the corner. So uh, we got a lot to look forward to. And that is just going to do it for this week's report. For any more info on these events and more, go to OxfordAthletics.org. There is plenty of game breakdowns, final games scheduled, uh, as well as upcoming news on Oxford sports, all right there for you to check out. Once again, that is OxfordAthletics.org. While you're at it, might as well check us out at OCCTV.org. All of our coverage of these events and more can be found on our YouTube page, which you can access through the website. Uh, once again, that is OCCTV.org. I want to thank you all for watching and remind you to tune in next time. But until then, I'm Cody Wright. 
Go Wildcats! Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Ford Motor Company is working on a way to resolve what self-driving researchers refer to as the last 50-foot problem. If an autonomous delivery vehicle arrives at your house without any humans on board, who's going to carry the package, grocery bags, or piping hot pizza to your doorstep? A robot, of course, could be up to the task with no tipping necessary. In Ford's case, the solution is Digit, an android with two stork-like legs, arms capable of carrying a 40-pound load, and a camera and crusted torso topped by a puck-shaped laser radar sensor. And it could be the headless cousin of a battle droid from the much maligned Star Wars prequels. <laughs> the business case for driverless delivery is even more compelling than robo-taxis and potentially easier to execute. For one thing, there's no need to worry about the safety of human passengers. And the rise of online shopping has turned package delivery into a huge growth area. Just ask Amazon, which spent $27 billion last year on delivery costs. Remove the human driver from the equation and delivery costs could plunge by 60% or more. The benefits could be in the billions. Ford would like to, take, like to deploy digit uh, delivery robots as early as 2021 alongside the planned introduction of its autonomous vehicle fleets to ferry people and packages around the clock. How real humans will react to this delivery android is a key part of Ford's research which is getting underway and will include real world, world tests inside Ford factories and on sidewalks near its headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan and in Pittsburgh. The inoffensive appearance is going to be a key thing for people to be able to trust a robot. Digit was created by Agility Robotics, a startup with fewer than 30 people based in Albany, Oregon. Chief Technology Officer uh, John Hurst said the, he hasn't seen anyone react negatively when meeting Digit or a forebear that lacked a torso and was simply a pair of piston-like legs attached to a motorized midsection. The robots have been allowed out on the town. And over at Chevrolet, General Motors has updated its teen driver software with a safety feature that will debut this summer in the 2020 Chevrolet Traverse. When teen driver mode is active, buckle to drive prevents drivers from shifting into gear without their seatbelt being buckled, GM said May 21st in a statement. According to a 2017 report by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 59% of high school students reported wearing seatbelts when riding as passengers. Tricia Morrill, GM's global safety strategy engineer at Chevrolet said parents can set audio volume limits, speed warnings, and limits along with a report card that gives parents data on teens' actions while driving. This is a fact-based tool and you can use to facilitate the conversations with your teens, Morrow said. The teen driver software also can silence the vehicle's sound system until the passenger and driver's seat belts are fastened. There you go, kids. In our next story, Fiat Chrysler Automotive is recalling more than 600,000 minivans and trucks in the U.S. in two separate recalls. The automaker said May 17th that the wiring harnesses of 2017 to 2019 Chrysler Pacifica minivans may be exposed to a sealer which can disrupt its electrical circuit and cause the vehicle to stall or lose power steering control. FCA is unaware of any related injuries or accidents, however. A total of over 198,000 vehicles will be recalled in the U.S., and the automaker said additional vehicles will be subject to the recall including nearly 8,300 in Canada and over 1,100 in Mexico. Affected owners that experience vehicle stall may immediately restart the minivan while steering capability would remain despite power steering loss, FCA said. U.S. sales of the Pacifica through April uh, fell 29% to over 23,000 vehicles. Separately, FCA also announced it is recalling more than 410,000 pickup trucks in the U.S. for a possible defect in the tailgate power locking mechanism. A small internal component in the mechanism may break over time and unlatch the tailgate. FCA said it's recalling over 63,000 pickups in Canada and 4,000 units in Mexico. Affected vehicles include the 2015 to 2017 Ram 1500, 25 
2,500 and 3,500 pickups equipped with 8-foot cargo beds, as well as 2018 versions of the same trucks manufactured through March 31st of 2018. The automaker said the defect doesn't concern the redesigned 2019 Ram pickups, nor does it concern trucks equipped with manual tailgate locks. FCA is unaware of any related injuries or accidents from the issue. An FCA spokesman had no further comment about the recalls beyond the press releases. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life sideways. <laughs>